You are listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Today we are in London. Hello, I'm Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freib. Evening. And Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Lionel, where are we? Uh, we are outside the Westminster Arms Public House, um, enjoying a post-stage beer, just along from the press centre, which is in uh, Capitol Hall, Central Hall, sorry, um, Westminster. A just short hop across the park from where the stage finished um, this afternoon. Um, there's a lot of uh, people out having a drink, I suspect, have been to watch the race, perhaps um, knocked off an hour early to go and see the race crowds were absolutely huge it was like the olympics all over again wasn't it it was it was all the way i think there was there were a lot of fears um that today monday's stage would be slightly un- anticlimactic after those two phenomenal days in uh, yorkshire where the official viewing figures are now more than the population of great britain i think i think we're i think we're saying that's 80 million people turned out over the two days to watch the tour de france and uh, by tomorrow it might be 100. No, today again was wonderful. Cambridge was packed with people. We had the luxury, some of us, of staying in our own, sleeping in our own beds last night. And uh, so I, what, you know, I actually saw the start of the stage on on TV. And often, you know, it's a it's a sort of um, it's an old trope that the start of the stage is often the most exciting part. You see quite aggressive racing, lots of attacking. That wasn't the case at all today. Two riders slipped off I can't even remember who they were Daniel do you remember who this the Echappes were Jan Barta and yeah, Jan Barta. the fella from Britain Seche B-Day B-Day correct B-Day again yep and uh, yeah so but there was no uh, they were just they were just wanted to go to go clear and it was almost as though Sunday's stage was such a, a hard stage took a lot out of people that there was almost a sort of a, a truce called um, they, they fell quite a bit behind schedule and then obviously coming into London the rain started to fall it was it was a fairly sort of controlled affair Marcel Kittel won the second stage of this tour after winning Harrogate on Saturday and it was a very straightforward victory for him and I, I was just commenting to you guys earlier that we seem in the, in the blink of an eye to go to have gone from talking of this golden age of sprinting where Kittel Cavendish, who's obviously missing with his separated shoulder after crashing on Saturday, and Andre Greipel were, were all quite evenly matched. Greipel's been nowhere so far in this tour. His team weren't very present today. And Kittel looks so dominant that these sprints are in danger of being slightly predictable and, and boring even. Well, yeah, I spoke to John Degenkolb, who's performing lead-out duties for uh, Marcel Kittel in the Giant Shimano team, and, and my last question to him was, um, who, who now are your main rivals now that Cavendish has gone home? And he, he basically shrugged and didn't really give any kind of answer, because when you look at the start sheet now, there isn't a great deal of credible opposition to Kittel on the flat stages, and we could be witnessing uh, this year... Kittle's equivalent of Mark Cavendish's, Mark Cavendish's 2008-2009 when we won four stages, six stages, five stages the year after that. If you look at the, the flat stages that are to come in the, just in the first week, um, there's plenty of opportunities and assuming Kittle gets through the mountains, you know, he could be he could be six, seven stage wins by the end. That, that's the big assumption though, isn't it, Lionel, that he's going to get through the mountains. I mean, um, I wrote a feature recently for Pro Cycling Magazine about Kenny Van Hummel, a former infamous uh, Lantern Rouge in the Tour de France. Um, and, and Kenny Van Hummel got a reputation in the 2009 Tour de France, or he was labelled the worst climber in the history of the Tour de France um, by Jean-Francois Pescher, who was the competitions manager at the Tour at the time. And um, in this feature, I talked about who, in actual fact, is the worst climber in, in professional cycling. And uh, a fair few people put uh, Marcel Kittel's name forward so I think he will really really struggle especially you know you look at the steep climbs we've got ahead in the Vosges we've got the Alps um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he doesn't make it to Paris he made it last year but do you think this year's course is is more loaded against him because of those particularly the steep climbs yeah I would say so um, it was to be honest it was a bit of a mystery to me how he did make it through last year's tour it's shorter stages tend to be harder as well don't they for the, the time limit I spoke to Tom Veelers at the finish who was uh, Kittle's lead out man today in London and I asked about obviously what Kittle was like as a, as a leader 
and he said that, that the main thing is, is his confidence that he can win these sprints. A little bit like Mark Cavendish in his pomp, even now, that he sort of infuses his team with confidence. But he also felt, you know, patting himself on the back and the team collectively on the back that that Kittle also draws a lot of confidence from the team, which is a very effective unit. They came to the front a lot earlier today, about three and a half, four k's out, when they they sort of hidden the bunch far longer on Saturday in Harrogate and I asked about that and he said it was because the roads were wet and they wanted to be at the front, stay out of trouble, take some wider lines around the corners you, you talk about that confidence Rich, I mean one thing I've noticed with Kittle is that he doesn't obligatorily need to be on his lead out man's wheel, um, I mean for him the, the role the team plays um, in the closing kilometres is more one of stringing the bunch out and keeping the pace very high and keeping it neat and tidy but he doesn't necessarily have to be on on his lead out man's wheel we saw that today um you know we had the giant shimano team in a nice neat line but kittle was actually um separated from them for, for a while but obviously didn't panic again made good decisions as we've been saying at the moment he's so confident that he seems to make the, the right decisions at the right time all of the time well this seems to be the perfect time actually to hear from cohen de court one of the members of the giant shimano team and a key man in the lead out uh, I spoke to him after the stage here in London today and asked him to run through the whole of the Giant Shimano team and just explain who does what in preparing the sprint, controlling the bunch and then doing the lead out. But if you detect a bit of an Aussie twang to Condacourt's accent, that's because he, his girlfriend is Australian and he spends most of his winters there um, winding down and training for the new season. So this is Condacourt on the Giant Shimano lead out train. We've all got our specific roles on the team. We've, we've got a couple of the guys that have to uh, to right the front just to make sure that the breakaway doesn't go too too far away. Um, we've got uh, mainly Cheng, our, our Chinese teammate, uh, for that. But um, there's another couple of guys that can do the same uh, the same role as well. One of those is Dries de Venins, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. Dries is, uh, is is one of these guys that can can right the front also um, when it gets a little bit harder. So uh, he's he's very valuable in in that as well. Um, then uh, we've uh, got Tom Dumoulin who, uh, who kind of brings the train into position so he rides in a win for a very long time tries to uh, make sure that we don't have to spend any energy and still stay in the front then um, Albert Timmer uh, usually starts uh, to really get us to, uh, to the front of the race and, and usually does uh, about the first turn on the front and then um, after that uh, we've got Roy Curvis who, uh, who is also our, our road captain he um, he tells everyone where to go and where to be. Is he very loud, very uh, very Sergeant Major style? Does he shout out the orders? Um, actually, no, he's not. But he's, um, he's, he's, I think, a very natural leader. And, and uh, everybody listens when he's talking. So I don't think he has to shout too loud. I mean, a little bit more here is, you know, it's so loud on the side of the road. Yeah, he needs to shout a little bit louder. But in general, he's, um, he's, he's not a very loud guy. But he's, he's definitely a leader. And um, then um, after that, we uh, we now had uh, had John Dagenkorp uh, do a monster turn on the front. It, it was really uh, really impressive. And then it was my turn after that. I had to uh, guide the team through the last two corners, and then um, sort of accelerate out of the corner and swing off to so Tom Valus to do the final lead out this time. Uh, it was a little bit uh, different uh, two days ago. Then I was the guy that did the last turn on the front, but. We swapped it around for a fast uh, for a fast finish because Tom is uh, is very is a very fast sprinter himself and and I'm more of a strong sprinter so we turn it around that way and then uh, yeah Marcel is the last guy to go. Just uh, a couple of things. First of all, there was only a very small break of two riders. They went very early in the stage without very much resistance from the peloton. Why was that, and did that suit your team perfectly? It did. It did obviously suit our team perfectly because it means we don't have to chase that hard and. Uh, and it keeps it fairly quiet in the peloton, but um, it's, it's understandable that no one else really wanted to be in the breakaway because there's nothing really to gain. I mean, the other two days, there was at least a polka dot jersey to gain. Um, now that was sorted. Uh, I mean, there's an intermediate sprint, but there's nothing really to win there because it's just points for the green jersey, so the breakaway doesn't really win anything there. So all that the breakaway can get is TV time, and, and um, a lot of guys just prefer to save some energy and and try to uh, to spend that at days that it really counts. So um, that, that way it's easy. With John Degenkolb being such a fast sprinter in his own right, some people might be surprised that he is in the fourth 
place in uh, the lead-out train and not the last man before Marcel. Why does that work? It's um, uh, being a lead-out man is something completely different than to being a sprinter. Um, I don't think uh, a lot of sprinters are very good lead-out men. The, the case is that um, that it's a very specific role that you have to do. You really have to take care of someone else. It's it's like um, it's like driving around with a trailer, and you need to make sure that that guy is still following you, and you can't just go through gaps because um, you need to make sure that someone behind you can still fit through as well. And uh, and that way, I think um, it's better to put him uh, somewhere where he can really use his power and. Uh, and um, and just his his speed as well, but a little bit further in front where it's not as important that you know you, you guide someone uh, someone through the peloton. And very last question, then Marcel Kittel, how good is he compared to say Mark Cavendish and the other sprinters we've seen? Um, there doesn't seem to be a m- huge challenge to him today. He was he was so far clear. That's partly the job that you guys did to get him in that position. But then he has the horsepower to finish it off. Yes, he's incredibly strong. I mean, last year he was very strong and, and he won four stages, but it seems that um, it seems that he's even better this year. And when you see him sprinting, it's it's almost incredible. He, uh, it's like he just attacks. So I uh, I hope he can keep it up. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar, with Richard Moore, Lionel Bernie, and Daniel Freib. Here we are, part two of the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. You can find us on Twitter at cycling underscore podcast. We also have a website, thecyclingpodcast.com, and we are blogging daily. You can also find all our podcasts there. We actually passed a million uh, listens today since we began this podcast a little over a year ago, just before the 2013 Tour de France. So thank you very much to everybody who's listened it's, it looks very nice doesn't it on the page one one million if, listeners if only we had a listener for every spectator in yorkshire eh, rich oh my goodness we'll get there eventually daniel we'll get there eventually let's tie up a few loose ends from today's stage three reflect on our few days here we're going to keep this a, a fairly uh, a fairly shortish podcast because we've got to get, somehow get to france through a, a tunnel that's apparently blocked so we don't know how we're going to do that, but we're going to go and figure it out in a moment or two. And um, we also are aware that we want to keep the podcast below 40 minutes if we can, because we realise it's a lot of listening, a big commitment that people are making. So let's uh, not waffle too much longer. Any more loose from today? Mark Renshaw is third. Peter Sagan is second. Peter Sagan, I mean, what a talent. He He's sort of, I mean, two years ago he won three stages at the Tour. He won one stage last year. But at some point, you're going to have to say the Palmares does not match the talent, does it? Yeah, the difficulty is he's not a pure sprinter, is he, Peter Sagan? So we can't really expect him to beat Mark Cavendish at his best or Marcel Kittel at his best. But So he only really comes into play when the stages are a little bit harder and the, the real big sprinters get dropped. But if he, if he comes to the finish on one of those days when uh, Kittel doesn't make it over a, over a final climb, he's going to be the, the, the shoe-in to win, isn't he? But you're right, he's not racking up the victories at the rate that his ability would suggest. Or, but that's or because in general. I, w- I mean, I wonder how he feels about that, whether that's a uh, frustration for him. Because, you know, he was up there on Sunday as well. He, he, he can win in almost any terrain, almost. But he just is so fantastically good at all these things and not absolutely the, the best in the world at any one particular yeah, Rich, I mean, I said yesterday that I think he'd made a major mistake yesterday, and I stand by that by um, basically showing his cards too early, sort of too emphatically on that final client on Jenkin Road. Um, he was very, very strong, and, um, you know, he we, we heard on French television, Laurent Jalabert say earlier in the stage that he thought that Sagan was hanging on. Well, that was an ideal position for Sagan to be in, just making everyone believe that he was actually struggling um, later in the stage, he really came to the fore, looked very, very strong, was marking all of the moves. And at that point, everyone just says, well, there's no way that I'm going to mark any moves for Peter, even if it just means dragging Peter Sagan to the finish. So, uh, you know, he's got a bit to learn, I think, in terms of kind of race craft uh, and um, how to get the best use of his, you know, uh, as we've said many times before, fantastic repertoire of different skills. Yeah, there's a little bit of a similarity to the way that Fabian Cancellara went through a a phase in the Spring Classics of being so strong, so confident in his own ability that he thought he could drop people or he could could just um, ride away from them at any moment that he chose. And and of course that, as as we did say yesterday, 
it, it lights up a rider like a Belisha beacon. It basically says, mark me, follow me, watch what I do. And that's exactly what happened to Sargon in the run into Sheffield. But he's up there in a flat sprint, flat out sprint. He's going to win the green jersey. If he reaches Paris, he is going to win the green jersey without much of a um, much opposition, I, I would have thought. He's won the green jersey already, is it not? Well, yeah. now you talked there, you made the comparison with um, Cancellara at Lionel. I think what distinguishes them from um, you know, the majority of, of, of their rivals is that they're guys who have got multiple bullets. You know, um, it, Particularly in cycling these days, we see that um, guys can generally launch one attack and then um, they kind of go into, they go over their threshold and um, into the red and struggle to recover. Sagan we saw yesterday, you know, over over the Jenkin Road climb, he went once, twice, three times marking moves. And I thought you were going to break into a Lionel Richie song there. Once, twice, three times a lady. Yeah. Is, is that Lionel Richie? Of course it is. Yeah. Well, wow, that's what a perfect ending to my, to my contribution to this, <laughs> this debate. Well, you, I think you can contribute a little further because um, we've been asked by a few people on Twitter what's happening with Chris Horner, the 2013 Vuelta España champion. He's here. He's one of the three 40-plus-year-olds in the race. And um, is he here to contend for the overall or go for a stage, or is he perhaps targeting the white jersey as best young rider? I don't. I just don't know. Daniel, the gray, the gray, should be a grey jersey, shouldn't there, now, for over 40s? I mean, this must be a record, three 40-somethings in the race. Certainly in the modern times, yeah. Mm. I think in the sort of the early part of the 20th century, the riders would have been... There would have been some older... Um, riders, but why, why not a, an old rider's jersey over thirty fives? Why, yeah. why not? Why not? It's a good idea, but I would I would think that they would probably say that it doesn't really fit the kind of image of, of the sport. I think it might be a hard sell to the sponsors. Maybe I don't know who would sponsor it. I wonder. Saga holidays, <laughs> all sorts of possibilities. Daniel Chris Horner. Yes, Chris Horner. So um, he struggled. He had some problems on the first day. He was dropped for a while um, we, we weren't quite sure why that was initially today I spoke to Brent Copeland who is a South African team manager of Lamprey Merida I should point out that towards the end of my conversation with Brent we were interrupted by um, a gentleman a very swarthy we'll use that word again Richard swarthy but silver haired to continue the, with the theme that we introduced a minute ago um, gentleman and I turned around and it was um, none other than Jose Mourinho shook Brent's hand shook my hand which um I kind of regretted shortly afterwards. But previously, Brent had um, explained to me both Horner's struggles on the first day, um, also the role he's likely to have later in the race. And we also talked a little bit about Sasha Modelo, who obviously was Lampre's sprinter coming into this race, had a horrific first experience of the Tour de France, was dropped on the first day um, and pulled out yesterday and was effectively denied the opportunity to... A sprint for victory today on a, on a finish line that where he'd ridden well before he came second in the uh, Olympic test event to Mark Cavendish first stage he crashed well didn't really crash he just went into the back of someone on one of the climbs that bottlenecked uh, then he got going again there was a bit of a gap got back in when he got back in another climb bottlenecked dropped his chain by the time he put his chain on got to the top there was another gap and that's when that gap of 30 seconds grew to a minute and a half, but we had uh, two guys there to help him out with uh, Oliveira and Chipolai, so they got back in, it wasn't much of a problem. Yesterday we were pretty satisfied with his ride, because he's not really that kind of a rider that's punchy on those kind of climbs, so to finish 15 seconds behind was good, uh, we, we were pleased with that, he's pleased with it. The thing that's good for us is he's only got margin of improvement as far as we're concerned, because... He hasn't raced much this year. He's only really trained, so he can only get better in the next few weeks. Just got to get through these first few days until the Ardenberg without any problems, accidents or anything. And hopefully the first times he'll be able to show himself. In relation to the GC, I mean, is he going to have some freedom or is he there to work for Rui? Or? At the moment, he's there to work for Rui. Uh, obviously, on the 10th stage, we'll know exactly what's happening in GC. Yeah. We hope to have two cards up there to, to play with, uh, with the two of them. Uh, so at the moment, his role is to work, look after Rui, but we'll see how Rui goes, obviously. And just on um, Sasha Modelo, you lost a man yesterday, pretty horrible um, ex- first experience of the Tour de France for him, the first two days. Um, can you just tell us what happened with Sasha? So that was a pretty, especially for today's stage, we were really hoping for him to do well on, on 
today's sprint, but uh, he, he said that he had a bit of a stomach problem on the first day. Um, we thought it was maybe just nerves or tension. He's a bit emotional doing his first Tour de France, obviously. It's huge. Uh, then yesterday it seemed worse, and he had a bit of a fever in the morning. Uh, according to the doctor, he's picked up some kind of virus. So he said he had sore arms, he had a sore head, dizzy head. His fever wasn't too bad when he stopped, but he had 35 minutes with 30 k's to go, so he wasn't going to make it. There were so many people at the back there on his own, it was just a bit crazy and dangerous. So it was unfortunate because you know, with his form that he had the Tour of Switzerland, we really didn't expect him to go like that. But you know, if you get sick, there's not much you can do about it. But he got a taste of what his first Tour de France is like. I think he realised that the next one he comes to, he's got to be 100% concentrated. Into, so. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. So we heard there from Brent Copland. Um, Daniel, what does he know uh, Jose Mourinho, the Chelsea football manager, I should point out? Do they, do, does Mourinho know him? Is that why he interrupted your conversation, or does he know you? Um, I'm not actually sure whether I was the bigger um, attraction there and, and why he actually came to speak to us at that moment. But um, I, th- I suspect that he knows Rui Costa, who's the world champion, who's Portuguese, rides for Lampre Merida. Another possibility, Rich, is that um, his antenna were, twi- were twitching at that time because we'd actually started talking about Pippo Pozzato off the record, I must admit. Um, Anything tell us about people Pozzato? Well... It's not looking good between Lamprey and, and um, Pippo. I'll leave it at that, I maybe, think. Maybe, can we put a message on the podcast to people to maybe to, to answer his phone, respond to text messages? Well, Jose Mourinho was allowed on the Lamprey bus, and I'm not sure Pippo Pozzato gets permission to mm. jump aboard the Lamprey bus anymore. What kind of cycling team would Jose Mourinho run, Lionel? Uh, well, he would be an exponent of Catanaccio cycling. It would be very defensive. It would be... Um, there would be an, an awful lot of control. There would be, they they basically be sort of sky esque in Wiggins 2012, um, just all on the front, all looking kind of menacing in dark blue and and black, a sort of reverse of the sky jersey. I think J- Jose Mourinho's um, would be his choice. I think and um, kids are chucking themselves to the road. Yeah, and I think if there was any any sort of controversy up at the front of the bunch with any of his riders, you'd expect Mourinho to drive right through the centre of the bunch to get up to the front and have a word with the yeah. chief commissaire, and Fabian Cancellara. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and gesture wildly like Mad- Mark Maddio. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, let's, uh, let's reintroduce a, a very f- a popular um, little item that we had last year, uh, uh, for which we need to hear from our good friend uh, Ciro Scognamilio. And now, Pedaler de Charme. Lionel, any uh, <laughs> Pedaler de Charme today? Who's your Pedaler de Charme? I'll, I'll Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. I'll nominate John Degenkolb, who was very entertaining after the finish line with all sorts of you know, tricks. I don't know, skids, wheelies, whatever the kids do these days on their BMXs after the finish line, and was generally in a, a very chipper mood, as you would expect, um, having led Marcel Kittel towards his second stage win of the Tour. Lionel? Well, uh, mm, this is this is tricky. What, just for today or for the opening weekend? Lionel, Perhaps we, can, we, make it, we can make it for the opening weekend since we've not done it so far. Lionel, if you want um, a moment to think about that, just to add something on John Degenkolb, I'm led to believe that on his recce of the Yorkshire stages, he was absolutely fascinated by dry stone walls and how they were built. And this was pretty much all he was interested in for the duration of the 48 hours he spent in, in Yorkshire. Every time they encountered a dry stone wall, he had to... Start. I'm not sure who they did the record with. Perhaps Gary Verity, who was sort of Mr. Tour de France in Yorkshire. And he had to just stop and check that he'd got it exactly right about how they were made. He couldn't quite believe it. <laughs> Incredible stuff. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, <laughs> not quite sure where to go from there. Um, I would say, can I, can I nominate Pedaler Sans Charme, which is the anti-Pedaler de Charme? Yeah. And it's only something that I saw on the internet. And it's, again, it's one of the, you know, the Tour de France now... Is happening under such a microscope. Stay off the internet, Lionel. (laughs) Yeah, thanks. Um, (laughs) uh, The uh, there was a clip that emerged that somebody had taken of uh, Ramanus. Navadowskis of the Garmin Sharp team sort of slapping a camera out of a spectator's hand 
uh, on one of the climbs. I think it must have been Sunday stage uh, in Yorkshire. And um, obviously the riders were extremely tense both days. I think probably yesterday, Sunday, even more so. Um, than they were on the opening day because the crowds were enormous and um, they were mountain stage style um, crowds and Navadowskis obviously had had enough and I, I can see both sides of this because the riders were you know right on the limit of, of you know tension from start to finish it's, it is very rare in fact it took me back to the rollout stage um, in Rotterdam in 2010 where the crowds were so huge in the first 40, 50 kilometres before they got to the Belgian border, um, that they were closing in to the, the width of a car on, on really quite wide roads, and they were tempers frayed that day as well. Um, so I can see why he may well have lashed out, but it doesn't give a great image of cycling to see that, because now these things do get captured by somebody, and then they're on the internet, and then that was on the Yahoo News homepage, which is going to have a huge audience, isn't it? So Navadaskos living up to his name as the Honey Badger. Indeed, indeed. Very fierce animals, aren't they, honey badgers? They are known to slap cameras out of people's hands. That's what they're famous for. <laughs> Very shy animals, the honey badgers, then, obviously. And stand down cobras. It's a good yeah. job Ricardo Rico isn't there. <laughs> anyway, another, another nomination, uh, a multiple pedaler de charme. We've got to nominate the, 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 uh, the, the people who were out in Yorkshire making it such a memorable Grand Depart. Surely, every single person is a... Uh, An honorary pedal yeah, de charme. Sure, sure, we can do that. Uh, that'll that should just cap a wonderful weekend for you, getting the pedal de charme collective award. All of you. Um, okay, I'll uh, I'll go for uh, Brian Cockar, the the young sprinter Europe car, who's fourth fourth on Monday stage. He's I been up there. I spoke to him after the finish. He, he's a very he's a very I hesitate to use the word spunky, but um, he is a very <laughs> <laughs> entertaining young man really? L- loves Why? talking to the media um, he's, he's obviously um, thrilled to be doing his first Tour de France and really really believes in himself um, the, in Harrogate after the first stage he felt that he um, he could have won that stage today as well um, he was very very pleased with the lead out he'd got from Kevin Razor um, and in fourth place but I think he might come quite close to a he's, stage win at some point in the race he's getting close he's getting close he's certainly outshining uh, Arnaud Demar, a lot was expected of Demar, the French champion. Uh, he was he won here in the Mall actually last year in the London Surrey Classic, but he was down in the 14th today. Maybe maybe had a bad run in, but um, we expected a bit more of Demar, I think. Yeah, I did as well, and I think they've struggled sometimes to position him today. I think we saw Michael Delage, who is one of his key. Um, sort of lieutenants was kind of struggling around 1.2, 1.3 kilometres to go to, to get Lamar in, um, Demar into a, a decent position. Um, he's he's had a couple of problems with. I think he's had an arm injury yesterday. I think he had a, or a wrist injury. Um, but I expect him to come to the fore on the fifth stage over the pave. I mean, on paper, you looked at the tour route and you you would have said that. Um, if there was an argument to pick Arnaud Demar over Nasser Buhani, we know that it was it, it was really for political reasons because um, Buhani is leaving next year, whereas Demar is staying at FDJ. But from a purely technical point of view, um, I think that Demar has a good chance in in that stage, and that was one reason for Mark Madio to pick him. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Tweet us at cycling underscore podcast okay let's wrap this up fellas because we need to get on the road and we'll be back in France tomorrow so a few other little uh, items of business um, Dave Brailsford was in Le Keep today Monday an interview with Dave Brailsford where he was quoted as saying that he would like to win the Tour de France with a French rider it's interesting he did actually shoot that down in flames a little bit at the end of the stage he distance himself a little bit from those quotes he said he was speaking more in a general sense that it, it's wonderful he equated it to a British tennis player winning Wimbledon it's always wonderful when a homegrown player rider wins the that country's marquee event um, but I, I just wonder you know he is a bit of a, a Francophile isn't he Brailsford he's he spent years of his, uh, his some of his teen years in France he travelled to France every year with his father who who now lives in France, he's a, a climber 
in France. Um, well, that where he said on the podcast before when he was racing as a young man in, in France, he lived uh, not far from Badois, and he'd fill up his bidons um, from the spring there. The sparkling yeah. water, the, the sparkling, sparkling Badois. That's right. He, uh, is it, I mean, is it true, the rumour, I, I really hesitate to share any rumours on this podcast after having my fingers burned in the past, but it's true that Warren Barguy might be on his way to Sky, is that a, is that, or is that just a rumour? Daniel. No, I think he will. He <coughs> will leave the team that he's at at the moment, um, Giant Shimano, and they obviously have problems um, to do with securing a sponsor for next year. I, I'm, I'm led to believe that Giant have pretty much guaranteed their commitment um, to a level which will allow the team to go forward, but they're looking for a co-sponsor. But Bargy uh, will leave, I'm pretty sure. Um, he has been sort of separated from his coach, who is also... Um, Thibaut Pinot's brother, Julien Pinot, they have worked together for a long time. Francis de Jure, FDJ, put their foot down at the start of the year and said, and we don't want Julien working with other riders. So that was one slight bone of contention. And um, it's uh, it's not been a wasted year for Bargui, but he certainly hasn't kicked on to the extent that we expected. He's still got the Vuelta ahead of him. And I think Brailsford is a big admirer. If you look at you know the, the kind of... Um, capacities required to win a Tour de France Bargui is a very good climber um, not yet a particularly good time trialist but he has the physique for it um, he's quite a tall guy and um, quite a sturdy physique so there's a lot there to work with but he's a long long way off at the moment yeah, I mean uh, Brailsford was interested in Pino as well I mean I think they tried the same Pino didn't they? Yeah he's, he's a long time admirer of Thibaut Pino and, and again um, Pino has fantastic ability as a kind of diesel in the mountains. He reminds me a little bit of um, Ivan Basso. Um, can go f- for sort of 30, 40 minutes um, on so fairly long climbs, uh, uh, a very high pace. Struggles at the moment a little bit with accelerations, but really struggles with sort of racecraft. And you know, I spoke to Julien's brother today, and he said he's really had a hard time the, these first three days, um, particularly the, the stages in Yorkshire, just because it's been so so stressful and. Um, time trialling, although it's improving, is still a bit of an Achilles heel as well. So, someone on Twitter today, just we'll, we'll finish this up in a minute, but someone on Twitter today asked if we would be able to interview Bernard Rees for this podcast. We will interview Bernard Rees, I'm sure. At some point, I can think of lots of questions to to ask him about the team, about his relationship with Oleg Tinkoff and his relationship with Alberto Contador, etc., and the team's approach to this race. But feel free to tweet us if you if there's anybody else you would like us to seek out an interview. Um, anybody you want to hear from, um, it's kind of a prerequisite that they speak English. I um, tried to, to interview uh, Joaquim Rodriguez today after the stage, but his English wasn't really up to it. He speaks Spanish and Italian very well, um, so that's that's a bit of a prerequisite for the podcast, obviously. But. Rodriguez actually Any, anyone know what's really happened with Rodriguez we're going to try and find out because he's come into this tour um, having crashed out of the Giro but doesn't his head doesn't really seem to be in it so far so uh, he's, he's said that he's be hunting for stage runs in the final week speculation um, only but uh, I did mention this in the pre-tour blog our little questionnaire who do you think will win the King of the Mountains and I thought Rodriguez because um, he's not in the shape to contend overall. Even if he was, what's his limit? It's going to be fourth, fifth, sixth, something around that region in the Tour de France. So stage wins and, and perhaps a tilt at the polka dot jersey. And, and if he can ride himself in, survive the cobbles, get through those couple of days in the Vosges, I think, you know, nice weather in the Alps and Pyrenees. Um, we'll see him very active. But he'll, And he kind of, in order to have a role in the, in the race in those stages, he needs to be out of the picture overall so losing 10-15 minutes over the first weekend will probably work out pretty well for him Uh, just on the king of the mountains one of the pre-race favorites for that jersey was pierre roland he rode an extremely good giro d'italia so good in fact and he finished fourth so good that i doubted whether he would have um, enough juice left for the tour de france and to and to contend for that title it was an objective he said that he would go to the giro to ride the overall and he would come here to look for a stage and the king of the mountains title but um, on the evidence of the first three stages, um, he's still pretty fresh and could be a real threat on that competition. Right, let's wrap up. I think we're all heading off. Daniel, you're you're heading off as well. Lionel, we're off to try and get through that tunnel. Uh, wish us luck. And we'll, uh, we'll speak to you again in France. Lionel, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Daniel, thank you. <laughs> podcast daily during the Tour de France. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar.